Few writers are better than Max Licato. No subject is better than God's grace, says Randy Alcorn, one of many Christian authors and leaders who have enjoyed the latest book by Max Licato. Here it is, grace, more than we deserve, greater than we imagine. Uh, I, I have to reminisce, Max, just for a moment. And you couldn't help me. It was either 1993 or 94, for sure. Uh, Christian Booksellers Convention in Denver, Colorado. Uh, I think every year they have a big hoop de doo Big concert night. I remember Twyla Paris was on the stage. Many other renowned Christian artists. And you were on the stage. And I hope I don't get emotional saying this. You shared how your literary hero had been Chuck Swindoll for all your growing up life and beginning of your writing career. You told us in the 80s you started to put pen to paper. And then Chuck Swindoll got up on the platform mm. and he said, Max has surpassed me. Mm. And I just wondered what that moment mm. was like for you. Did you know that, did, that he was there, that he was going to say those words? I knew he was there. I didn't expect him to say that. He's such a good man. He's such a good man. You know, um, what a treasure these ministers like Chuck, who have given decades and decades of faithful service every year. You know, I think Chuck's in his early 70s, maybe mid 70s now. I would think so. Still preaches every weekend. His insight for living radio programs still as strong as ever. Um, you know, though, the, these men and women who uh, log the years, who invest the decades, the Eugene Petersons, the Billy Grahams, the, the, the men and women who, who in their 70s are still faithfully serving, in their 80s faithfully serving. That's what inspires me. I have a book here. You see, I've got a little stack. These are just the ones I, I uh, picked up s sitting around. Like this is in our guest room. No wonder they call him Savior. Six hours one Friday, and the angels were silent. There are three of your books right there. Three of your 82 million. I still can't. I don't know what you've done. You've raised three daughters. You have a wonderful <laughs> wife. You, you know, you're such a balanced man, but I, I just I get this image of you locked away, writing hour upon hour. They only uh, let me out once a day, once a week. <laughs> I'm in a cavern. <laughs> you're one of the most balanced people I've ever met. Uh, the Locato Inspirational Reader. This is d a devotional book. I think, yes. And this one, I was hoping you would come here when this book came out because I just loved the title. Look, look at it. Live Loved. And, and you know why I'm not disappointed? This is a devotional. is because your book on grace is the key. It's a huge key to living loved. And as a pastor, preacher, a former missionary, tell me how many Christians you've met I mean, you don't have the number, but how often you've met people who love Jesus, who don't feel loved, who don't know how crazy God is about them. Mm. Is that yeah. not a crisis? And you can tell those who do. Have you noticed it? Those people who are stunned by God's love for them, there's a, such a softness to them. There's a bit of a sparkle in their eyes and they're, they're, they're happy spirited. And those who uh, feel like they have to earn God's favor every day, they're so tired, just, just logging through life, walking, slugging through life. If you don't think God loves you, if down in your core you're not convinced that God loves you, it's going to result in one of two things, either arrogance or inferiority. Mm -hmm. Arrogance because you're going to think, I've got to prove myself to God. And so you're always boasting. You're always boasting. The famous passage about grace, for we're, you're saved by grace through faith, not by works, so no one can boast. Uh -huh. See, grace destroys boasting because there's no need to boast because I'm not saved by what I do, I'm saved by what God did, so why would I boast anyway? It just makes all boasting irrelevant. Or the other consequence of not believing in God's love is this utter insecurity, this despair, this feeling of brokenness and lostness. I, I've, I've been following um, some of the tragic stories of teenage suicide in Canada. So, um, and of course, they're all over the world. And I think, is there, a, is there an answer to this? And at the risk of over-spiritualizing it, I think what, what these young people need to know is that God loves them.
What is the beautiful scripture? Accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. There's nothing better than that. The king of the universe yeah. died, loves you, died for you, is for you. I mean, it's an impossible time to be a teenager in many ways. You know, they get on Facebook or, or Twitter and everybody's blasting them and blasting them. It just beats them down, beats them down. Well, how do you counteract that? Well, you counteract it with the, you know, I don't care what they say about me. I believe I'm bought by God. I'm owned by God. I was made by God. You know, this, this idea that we can create a self-image based on, uh, you know, how healthy we look or our six-packs or, our, you know, six-pack abs or our breasts or our face. Right that, clothes. That's not going to work. It just doesn't work uh, because we don't, we're not that <laughs> strong. And our bodies are, 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 are they're already dying the minute we're born. And so that doesn't work. God's... God's plan is that your image is not really a self-image, it's a God image. It, it's how God sees you. You're made in the image of God. You're bought by God. And life is not for this life, it's the next. And if we can get this into our young people, that would be the anecdote for this spirit of despair that comes over uh, our, our, our young people. And that's what grace is, you know. Is grace there going to be a teen version of this? There Why? already is. Is it? There already is. It's called Wild Grace. Okay. Wild grace. Man, we need yeah. it now. We do, don't we? We need it now, Max. I wanted to just grab uh, an example, in, in case you haven't read Max Licato, of the, the way you phrase things. This is so beautiful. He stooped, low enough to sleep in a manger, work in a carpentry shop, sleep in a fishing boat, low enough to rub shoulders with crooks and lepers, Low enough to be spat upon, slapped, nailed, and speared. Low, low enough to be buried. And then he stood up. I want to go to the standing up. Mm. I've actually pulled um, Romans 8, 34. You, you have it in the message. Look at this. Teenagers watching, look at this. Jesus is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Love that translation. Amen. You don't think anybody sticks up for you or stands up for you? Well, Jesus does. Jesus does. Well, I'm just thinking, everybody knows the promise stated many times and from Jesus' own mouth, I will never leave you or forsake you. How can you connect that to not arriving in heaven mm. or not measuring up when he's already said, I'll never bail on you. Grace, grace is, is, is a, the word that the Bible uses to describe God's commitment to us. His commitment to us. His ruthless commitment to us. And God cannot fail. Mm -hmm. He cannot. He simply cannot. It's not just that He will not. He cannot. His character will not let Him fail. And so that's why Paul could write such drastic statements like he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. He didn't say he may bring it to completion or better hope he brings it to completion. He's saying he's going to bring it to completion. Uh, he's moved in and since he cannot fail, then he's got a hold of you. And that's why we can believe that no one can snatch us out of the hands of Jesus. Nobody can. A a again, grace I, I like to say it like this. Grace is the word the Bible uses to describe God's radical commitment to rescue and redeem a people with whom he'll reign forever. It's a radical commitment on God's part in which he takes the initiative and he's going to rescue and redeem. He's going to save and he's going to sanctify. He's going to pluck out and he's going to build up. He's going to do all of these things. He's going to take a hold of us and change us and redeem us to the point where we will be uh, able to live with him for eternity. This is what we have to remember. God is not all about fixing us and making this life great. God is all about preparing us for the next life. And in this life on earth is when he does his work for us and in us so that we'll be able to work with him in heaven. And here's how you phrased, well, a couple of phrases about the ongoing work of God by his Holy Spirit in us. Grace hugged the stink out of the prodigal and scared the hate out of Paul. All your efforts to win affection are unnecessary. It's just the truth. Mm. Of all the things that a person uh, needs to be concerned about, one thing they don't need to be concerned about is the undying affection of God. 
That's settled. <laughs> he has proven it once and for all. So, you know, be anxious about the stock market if you want to. Be anxious about your hockey team if you want to. Be anxious about the weather if you want to. But don't be anxious about whether God loves you or not. He's taking care of that. Take a look at this because this is, a, this is part of the ongoing work and reality. Though the work of Christ is finished for the sinner, it is not yet finished in the sinner. Mm-hmm. He's all over us to make us all he, is. he wants us to. A friend of mine says it like this, that, that God, is, God is not concerned, that, that God's desire is not just to get us into heaven, but to get heaven into us. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's, it's, grace is not a get out of jail free card <laughs> or get out of hell free card. Grace is this commitment. It's the word the Bible uses to describe this commitment that God has to redeem us and, and to, re- not, to rescue us and redeem us, to change us. So here's what happens. When you give your heart to Jesus, he returns the favor and he gives you his heart. He moves in and he begins changing you from the inside out. The way we respond to this is we simply, number one, accept it. We accept it. And then number two, we cooperate with this work. We accept it. We believe it. I believe every day we need to say, thank you, Lord. I am saved. Not thank you, Lord. Will you save me? Mm -hmm. Once you have given your heart to Christ, you're saved. You're in. You're adopted. You're a part of the family. Now let God change you. Have thine own way, Lord. Exactly. Exactly. How, How do we let him change us? Well, we go to him like a branch goes to a trunk of a tree. Uh, actually, in John 15, as we were discussing, it, it's not the tree and the branch, but it's more the vine and the branch. And it, it, the, the grape grower is the analogy here. And Jesus, God is the one who takes care of the garden. And Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me or stay with me, you're going to bear much fruit. So our goal is to stay close to Christ. We and do we the, do that through reading God's Word. Through reading God's Word. Talking to Him. Talking to Him, prayer, through worship, and through thinking about Him, mm-hmm. through constantly thinking about Him. The more I can just say, Lord, what are you up to right now in this very moment? What are you up to right now as I'm driving? Well, t- tell me something, Father. Speak to me. Mm-hmm. And our goal is to live in this cease, unceasing communion with our Heavenly Father. Our goal is not to bear fruit. Fruit is a consequence That's very of connection. Somebody just spoke up. Our goal is not to bear fruit. Isn't that interesting? I've been a pastor all my life, and I catch myself saying, okay, go out and be patient. Uh, Go out and love somebody. Uh, Go out and and, uh, have self-control. But then the scripture says these are fruits. You don't go to a tree and say, you know, make an orange. The orange doesn't do that. The branch can't do that. The branch stays connected to the trunk. And if the branch is connected to the trunk, an orange results. It's a conduit. Ap- exactly. And it's a consequence of connection. Mm-hmm. So my goal must every day be, and your goal every day must be, okay, Lord, how can I stay connected to you today? Do not let me have one moment, Father, in which my mind goes into other stuff. Let me just be conscious. Let me be aware of you. Live your life through me today. Absolutely. It really is that simple. It is that simple. It's supernatural too. I think, I think we've got to be, you know, it isn't something that we're conjuring up. This is God in us uh, working out his plan. Yeah, he's got the plan. He's got, he's the, got plan. the plan. He's going to do it. His job is to create the fruit. Our job is to stay connected. You know, it's, it sounds simple, but I know, I know. You, you've admitted your struggle, yeah. Max, to, to get to this I said it yesterday, uh, Hudson Taylor, the exchange life, not I, but Christ. When you, when you make that shift, life is so free and full. Uh, why not explore what Max calls grace-shaped living? It's beautifully uh, presented in the book with wonderful stories. I have to let you tell some stories for sure. Next round. Um, also, there is a study guide, and it's beautifully laid out, either for personal study, Max, or ideal for your small group. So, first you need to get your copy, and uh, here's how you can. This is a very special limited time offer that we are so thankful to be able to provide you with as you make your best ministry gift to Crossroads. We have such an amazing platform here. Even as we prayed uh, coming to air, we. Thank God for the freedom and the privilege of telling the best news there is. 
This is about abundant living. Whatever life means for you right now, wherever you are, it's a promise of Christ that as you turn to him and trust in him, you will live life to the full. Be encouraged as you get your copy of this book and don't miss round three with Max Lakato right here tomorrow.